was a treaty between the Seneca Nation and the United States government. And it promised that we would, we would never be disturbed, that the land would be ours forever. But with the advent of the Kinzua Dam, there was a break in the treaty. And it was very a very sad time for us because this is a treaty that we thought would, would be ours, our ours forever and ever to remain where we lived and to be free, to have freedom, to live as a, as a Seneca people. up here to Jimerson Town, but I grew up in a neighborhood that was uh, predominantly family. My grandparents were there and aunt and uncles and um, cousins and um, their in-laws to, you know, my aunts. And so um, so we, we all knew one another and as a child I just would run throughout the whole neighborhood. And uh, we lived on one end and my grandmother lived on the other, so I could really go just house to house till I got to my grandmother's house. And um, I just had a lot of a lot of good memories. They had um, what they referred to as these uh, quilting bees, where my mom and my grandmother and her sisters would make uh, blankets along with some of the the neighborhood women. They would all sit in a circle around uh, this uh, this area where they would um, where they would uh, make blankets. And they would just discuss the local uh, topics or gossip of the day. But it was a way of um, those women getting together and um, share common uh, memories of, um, of what was going on, talk about the, their past. And, um, you know, just a good feeling for people to, to gather. Afterward, uh, we would have a big uh, supper in the kitchen where, um, the women, their husbands, and my mom's family, and everybody would gather, you know, get together. It, it, was, it was just a happy time. Well, um, the the basic premise that the Seneca Nation stood on was the fact that we had a treaty. And uh, this one treaty in particular was the Canandaigua Treaty. Some call it the Pickering Treaty, and it was made in 1794. And uh, this was a treaty of peace. And that treaty stipulated that this land where we lived would always be ours. And we it would never be taken from us unless we said it was okay. And uh, so the premise being that uh, we were not allowing our land to be taken from us or uh, to be sold. And so the Seneca Nation uh, went to court um, uh, with that case, uh, with that treaty. Yeah, the, the, you got to remember that when this first started, that the Seneca Nation government only met once or twice a year and it was a very small organization. And they had quite a fight against um, what's known as the Iron Triangle, the Pittsburgh Industrialists, and the, um, and the Army Corps of Engineers, and then the U.S. politicians all kind of working in concert to make this dam happen. As a result of Kenzu Dam and going through that as the children and watching um, others my age that have gone through it, is that uh, we learned real fast about our rights and our treaties 
and uh, what they're supposed to mean and how we want them upheld. Um, we knew that as simple as it was, even at probably age eight, um, I knew a treaty was being broken. And I remember my dad telling me a treaty is the supreme law of the land. He said that's the biggest law there is in the world, the treaties. And that was what was broken when they built Kenzu Dam. He said that was illegal, it was a wrong act. They didn't honor our treaties. And that has always stuck in my mind. And I think some of the kids my age, uh, we really took that to heart. Um, the Seneca people definitely were fought against the dam from the very beginning, going way back. In fact, the, in fact, the first seeds were sown about the dam way back in 1908, although the dam doesn't get built until 1964, 65. Um, what they did, basically, you can divide it up into two different ways. There was a kind of a legal battle that was going on, um, a legal, legal battle that the Senecas fought. and. There was also the, the PR battle um, that they fought, and th that included dem demonstrations and going on TV and talking to, you know, and writing letters and a whole variety of other things. The legal battle um, went all the way from the lowest courts and, and trying to issue a stay to the, to the Army Corps from, from, um, from surveying and, and working on the lands uh, and then all the way up to the Supreme Court, which they were denied access to the Supreme Court. The Tribal Council had made a resolution that they would fight the dam, that we would remain where we were forever. So <clears throat> we went to Washington many times to talk to congressmen, senators, to have them help us fight the dam so that we could remain where we were. And we had a great deal of help from the Quakers, the Friends, we call them. And they wrote letters out to people all over the country. They did a lot of publicity for us. And it helped us a lot in our fight to keep our lands. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers had uh, surveyors uh, survey the whole Seneca Reservation from this, the city of Salamanca, which included areas of Jimerson Town, Shango, Red House, Cold Spring, Quaker Bridge, Ornaville, and a Hotchkiss Hollow area. Uh, the 1365 Floyd easement line um, was established affecting all those areas. And um, as I said, it affected some 10,000 acres of uh, Seneca territory, which uh, the Senecas could no longer build their houses on. They were only allowed to use it for hunting in some, uh, some of the higher areas, used it uh, to plant uh, their gardens, their crops, and um, for uh, recreational facilities. Um, I think it started becoming a reality for me when I actually began to see the bulldozers. And uh, we had a large hill in front of our house. And um, and the bulldozers came, and, and they weren't just bulldozers, they, they called them earth movers. And um, they literally shaved off the, the front of the hill there that faced our house, and um, all the trees were down, and, and it just started, um, they went from hill to hill all the way down through the valley. 
and they started clearing out um, the flatlands and um, so it at that point it became very real and I remember as a little girl sitting out in front of my house and and uh, watching those bulldozers on the hill um, and and I remember hollering things at them as, as if that would you know make a difference or maybe they would know how I felt but um, I think that was uh, when I really realized things were changing. It affected the elders uh, the most. They felt very sad, very tragic. They felt lonely and they did not want to move. They did not want to leave their homeland. And some of them became sick and some of them died. Now the, uh, probably the um, the next, next age group would be probably in their middle age. It affected them too, maybe not as much as the older people because they knew they had to adapt. They knew they had to relocate because, because of their families. And I think they adapted a little bit better than the elders. And the younger people uh, were affected also, but they also became, I think, better adapted because their parents had to move and maybe they uh, thought it was a good experience. Although listening to their elders, I'm sure that they realized what was happening. One thing um, that comes up when, when I talk about this with people who, um, who were removed is, the, is well, there are several things, but it was kind of a, a a disbelief that it was happening, I think, and the process happened from from downstream to upstream, and it just kind of slowly, um, slowly over a period of months, actually, you know, they would tear down the houses in one place and flatten out the land and move those people up upstream, and and if so, if you lived upstream, you, you watched this happen to your friends as it started to build its way up towards you, and um, and one person in particular that I remember telling me that they just came home from from school and their house was gone. And even though they were waiting for it to happen, they didn't know exactly when it was gonna happen. Um, and so this process was um, something that they, it, it, it was a cause of anxiety for, for a long time. And then after, and, and meanwhile, at the same time, the lots were given in Steenberg and, um, the lots were given in Steenberg and Jimtown and, um, People, people were moving into their, their their new homes. I guess you could call it, um, and and the decisions were being made about you know who was going to live live near who. So there was a lot going on at that time. My mother, my mother's family, um, grew up in the Cold Spring area. Her parents uh, lived in that house from the time that I can remember. Um, and they also had to move uh, to a relocation area. They chose the Steenberg relocation area because it was near where the where their original house was, and they wanted to be close to their home and close to uh, areas that they remember. So they chose 
to live in the Steenberg relocation area. It affected me because I felt very sad. I, I wanted to live at my own homestead the rest of my life because it was peaceful there. It was home to me and I was attached to the land. Seneca people have become very attached to land. They do not want to leave their homeland and they do not want to move. This seems to be the way we think and the way we feel. But eventually I knew that we had to relocate and we did. We made the best of it that we could. Um, there was, uh, what I've observed that, um, on the one hand, there was, it was almost like it was quiet after, in that I think people were just coming out of the shock. And, um, you know, th they say there are stages of grief, and I think we went through that and, um, on an individual basis and even as a nation. If you look at Native American history in general, um, it, it, it's a process that that the U.S. government has kind of um, gone through with with tribes throughout the entire country, um, and the process is is to move them. Well, it's, it's to slowly destroy the the culture and assimilate and assimilate people and to make them into minorities within their own land. Um, and uh, and <clears throat> when you look at the when you look at Kenzua, it's, you know, you're talking not too long ago, not too long ago. Um, this is an ancient history in the 1960s. This process was still going on, and, and when I look at it from the very, uh, from a historical standpoint, I, I see, um, I see it as one more step in that entire process that included, you know. Um, that in included wars and reservations and um, and not following treaties and and boarding schools and and all of this um, this was just one more step so now um, the the land that was so important to the Seneca's and you know the ten thousand acres that was lost it, um, it it's gone and it's one less thing that they can hold on to cult culturally I think that we always have to be aware and prepared as a nation. Um, my father told me, I, could, I think from when I was a little girl, when he would tell me about treaties and some big word called sovereignty, he would talk about those things. And, and he would always say that as long as we have land, they're going to always be after us. And, and I, I really believe that. And, and I've seen that through my life. And there's always something that um, the government, whether it's New York State or even the federal government, um, they will come after and, and they will continue to do that as long as we have um, this land base and uh, consider ourselves the Seneca Nation of Indians. <clears throat> that, uh, that's one thing. From going through Kenton Zoo Dam, something so horrible that uh, it does make you feel like you can't trust. You, you've got to gotta watch out because it can happen again. Oh, I don't want to forget that. And I don't want our people to forget that. Because uh, when we do, we're going to get lazy and we won't be ready, won't be prepared. We always got to be ready. Every year we have a program that we call Remember the Removal. And it began in the 1980s where we set aside one day to remember the removal. We, we have speakers, we have pictures of the removal, and we usually have very large crowds of Seneca people who attend this, and this is 
whether we talk about our experiences, how we felt when we had to move, and, and we would do not want it ever to happen again. So this is a yearly event for us, remember the removal. This also teaches the younger people about the Kinzua Dam, how people felt, how they had to make plans to relocate, and how eventually they had to re-adapt, to adapt to a new way of life. As long as the moon shall rise, as long as the river flows, as long as the sun will shine, as long as the grass shall grow. The Senecas are an Indian tribe of the Iroquois Nation. Down on the New York-Pennsylvania line, you'll find their reservation. After the U.S. Revolution, Corn Platter was a chief. He told the tribe these men they could trust. That was his true belief. He went down to Independence Hall, and there a treaty signed that promised peace with the USA and Indian rights combined. George Washington gave his signature, the government gave its hand. They said that now and forevermore that this was Indian land. As long as the moon shall...